All right, well, it's been a while since I've been back, so I figured I would uh, start with a fairly light and non-controversial topic <laughs> and jump into this. Actually, this is the, the particular topic that I was dealing last week at uh, Fellowship Church, and so I admit that as pastors, sometimes we, we go with what is convenient, and uh, so this was readily available and at hand. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here with an agenda, okay, just in case anybody was wondering. Uh, but I, I, I love to wrestle with the truths of God's Word, and I hope you do too, and uh, just pray that this is a time where we're really encouraged and built up collectively. Uh, if you've been a member of a church, um, if you've kind of worked within Christian circles for, for any measure of time, you know that the issue of baptism is one um, over which there is some debate. There is essentially two camps um, when it comes to the topic of, of baptism. There are what we call pedo baptists uh, Pedo being a word for, for, for children, um, those who baptize believers and their children, and then there are those who are described as credo-baptists, credo being a word for, uh, for believe. Um, and so you have those who, who baptize only those who are able to make a credible profession of their faith. They're, those are essentially the, the, the two camps, I would say, in the debate. And there are a lot of areas over which we we disagree. Um, sometimes it's about the mode of baptism, it can be about the, the meaning of baptism, but certainly uh, about the recipients of baptism. But even though we, we disagree on a number of areas, we, we also agree on a number of areas. We agree, for example, that the church is called to go out and to baptize. Um, we agree that the church is called to baptize into uh, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we believe that we are, we are called to disciple individuals uh, in the ways and in the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I thought I would begin by reading from, from Matthew 28, the verses 16 uh, through 20, words of Jesus which uh, remind us that there is a lot of common ground, and so I thought I would start there, and then we'll get a little bit more into things uh, shortly. So Matthew 28, uh, let me read the verses 16 through 20. And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. All right, well, let's, um, let's get into the topic for tonight, this topic of baptism. Um, I have to admit that when I, when I speak about this topic, um, I do so in some ways with a measure of difficulty, and that's because uh, I, do, I do have a lot of Baptist friends. Um, I have uh, Baptist pastors and theologians who've been a tremendous blessing to me in my own uh, ministry and, and in my own development. Um, and especially when I'm here, I recognize the history of blessings in our partnership with Stanley Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, there are individuals here tonight uh, who I know and love, I see as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when I, when I speak on this topic, I do feel kind of an obligation uh, to, to do my best to present their position fairly, and I, I hope that I do so uh, tonight. And maybe you're like me, maybe you're someone who uh, who you have friends, maybe you have family that are kind of on both sides of the debate. And, and sometimes I encounter individuals, because they have people on both sides, they, they kind of end up in this place where they say, well, you know what, it's not a salvational issue. And, and I sympathize with that, okay? I understand that. And yet at the same time, I want to say it, it is an important issue, right? Because it is an issue that has certain implications. And I would say one of the implications is that it impacts how you view the church, how, how you view what Scripture calls the, the, the new covenant community. See, it, it's not just that we view baptism differently. I, I think this is something that's sometimes lost in the discussion. There, there is a sense in which we also, we view the, the church uh, through a different lens. And so what I want to do tonight is to kind of walk through um, the connection between baptism and between what I call covenant theology, and I'll, I'll kind of explain that uh, in a bit more detail tonight. 
I want to begin by just uh, reflecting on, on two uh, confessions, two documents that we have which reflect uh, the truths of Scripture as we hold to them here. Uh, one of them is going to come from the Heidelberg Catechism, and one is just going to be a paragraph uh, from the Belgic Confession. But I want to use them a little bit as a kind of a, a, a springboard into the larger topic, if you will. So if I can ask you just to respond uh, by reciting the, the question and answer from the Catechism, and then I will read uh, the paragraph from the Belgic Confession. And so the question that I'm dealing with uh, tonight is, is this question. And I think what I want you to notice is uh, the, the language that's used about uh, baptism and the connection here uh, to the idea of, of a covenant and a covenant community and membership. Okay, that's going to be a focus for tonight. So the question is, should infants too be baptized? And you can respond. For a moment there, I thought you didn't do responsive readings anymore. <laughs> Terrifying moment. Um, okay, so that, that's our reading from the Catechism. I, I want to read just this uh, paragraph from uh, another confessional document that we hold to, the Belgic Confession. So I'll just read this for you. This is the opening paragraph. It says, We believe and confess that Jesus Christ, who is the end of the law, has by his shed blood put an end to every other shedding of blood that one could or would make as an expiation or satisfaction for sins. He has abolished circumcision, which involved blood, and has instituted in its place the sacrament of baptism. By baptism, we are received into the church of God and set apart from all other peoples and false religions to be entirely committed to him whose mark and emblem we bear. This serves as a testimony to us that he will be our God and gracious Father forever. Now, I want to... I want to draw your attention to the phrase, um, by baptism, we are received into the church of God and set apart from all other peoples and false religions to be entirely committed to him whose mark and emblem we bear. What's interesting is that I think many of my Baptist friends would actually be able to affirm that statement. Uh, Wayne Grudem, who's a, a well-known pastor and theologian, in his book, uh, Systematic Theology, in his uh, explanation of Christian doctrine, when he's speaking about the issue of baptism, he says the following. He says, it is certainly true that baptism is the sign of entrance into the church. So, so he agrees with the Belgian Confession that, that baptism is a sign of being received into the church, into the covenant community. But he goes on to argue that the new covenant community is fundamentally different than the covenant community that you find in the Old Testament. And on that point, I would disagree. And so our differing views on covenant theology impact our views on baptism. Now, some of you are probably here tonight, and you're new to this, this whole argument, to this whole debate, and you're probably wondering, I don't even know what a covenant is. Okay, so we're going to start very simple uh, with the basics, and then I'm just going to kind of build out from there. So let me offer a definition of, of what we're talking about when we talk about a covenant. This is by uh, J.I. Packer, and he says, covenants in Scripture are solemn agreements that bind the parties to each other in permanent, defined relationships with specific promises, claims, and obligations on both sides. So, for example, when you get married, you are, you are making a covenant with your wife, with your husband. You, you are entering into a covenant, and you are, you are making a solemn, a, a serious, you're entering into a binding relationship that has promises and obligations on both sides. And the reason that this term, covenant, 
is, is so important when it comes to our understanding of the Bible is because when you walk through the story of the Bible, you discover that the whole thing is bound together through God establishing covenant relationships with people. Right? This is why we believe that covenant theology is, is incredibly important when it comes to your understanding of the broader story of Scripture. And I want to try and help illustrate that by, by way of an image. If we, can, if we can pull this up on the screen, okay, this kind of gives you... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll walk through this image, okay? Nobody panic. I'm going to walk through this. But it, it, just, it just lays out some of the covenants that you see described in Scripture. You see the covenant with Adam... Uh, there's a covenant with Abraham, Moses, David. There's the new covenant with Jesus Christ. There are a couple of other covenants that, that could be added, um, but for our purposes tonight, uh, this will be sufficient. So as many of you know, if I can just leave that image up there. So if many of you know, as the Bible starts with, with this story of the creation of the world, Adam and Eve, I'm going very fast here, and the fall into sin, okay? And God could have, Okay, just to be clear, God could have, at that point, ended the story. Right? He was very clear that if you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And so God could have ended the story, but what he does is he shows grace. And he establishes a, a, a covenant of grace. He enters into a relationship, and we get a glimpse of that in the well-known words that he says to Adam in even Genesis 3, verse 15, where he talks about the fact that through their family, there will one day come a child who will crush the head of the serpent. And, and the rest of the story of the Bible is the unfolding of that covenant relationship. As we see the covenant community expand and get bigger and larger and move out into all of the world. So if you look at your Bibles, I'll explain it this way. If you look at your Bibles, for example, okay, you could imagine that the title on the front of your Bible could be the covenant of grace. And then as you flip through the Bible, for example, as you flip through the Bible, you know you're starting, we'll start at the beginning, you're flipping through, and you have the covenant that God makes with, with, with Adam. And you, you flip a couple chapters forward in Genesis, and then you read about this covenant that God makes with Noah. And you kind of keep flipping through, and you get to Genesis 17, and there's a covenant that God makes with Abraham. And then we flip through into the book of Exodus, Exodus 20, and you have the description of a covenant that God makes with Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And you get into 2 Samuel, and you read about the covenant that God makes with David. And you keep flipping forward, and you get to the prophet Jeremiah, who speaks in chapter 31 about the new covenant that is ultimately going to come in Jesus Christ. And each one of these covenants is like a chapter in the story. Each one building upon the one that comes before it. Each chapter revealing a portion of the larger narrative of the covenant of grace. And that's at the heart of covenant theology, and it's bound together in Jesus Christ. So Jesus, for example, is described as the second Adam. Jesus is the ark, that you, can, that you can find shelter and safety in to be spared from God's judgment. Jesus is the seed from the line of Abraham through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the, the king that will reign on David's throne forever. The more that you start to understand this covenant theology, the more you start to understand the way that it ties the whole story of Scripture together. I want to pause for a second and, and just reflect on the covenant communities that we see in the Old Testament. Okay? So when we look at the covenant communities in the Old Testament, there are two patterns that emerge. One is that they all include children. Right? When we look at the composition, when, when we look at the nature of the covenant communities, Throughout the Old Testament, I, I think my, my Baptist friends would concede this point, that they all include children. And the second is that they all, in that covenant community, they include genuine believers, and there are also hypocrites. There, there are people who are externally kind of part of this community, but internally they don't actually believe. They're what 
Paul describes in Romans 9 as there are children of the promise and there are children of the flesh. And that brings us to the fundamental question when it comes to baptism. And that is the question, is the composition of the covenant community in the New Testament, is it fundamentally different than the covenant communities that we see in the Old Testament? Does it still include children? And are there still both genuine believers and hypocrites within the New Covenant community? I would say absolutely yes. My Baptist friends would disagree. And so we don't just view baptism differently. We view the New Covenant community differently. And I think that's important for us to understand. Your view of baptism and your view of covenant theology are, are directly linked. And what I want to do is just kind of lay out a brief argument. I, I have the advantage of arguing my own position, okay? So I'm going to do that. But, but I want us to look at the New Covenant community and just to reflect on that statement. When we look at the New Covenant community, do we see a case that there are children included? And do we see a case that there are still both genuine believers and hypocrites? I want to just touch on a couple passages as we walk through. Let me offer one. Acts 2, 39, very well known. You have Peter, and he's giving this great, incredible sermon on the mount. And in Acts 2, 39, you probably heard it recited many times. We read, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Peter, in this passage, is speaking specifically to the Jews. He's speaking to a covenant community. And he's talking about the reality of this new covenant that's come into place through Jesus Christ and how it's a good thing. It's getting better, this new covenant community. But he uses the language to say it's for you and it's for your children and it's for all who are far off. I would argue that if it was fundamentally different, he could have just simply said, the promise is for all whom the Lord our God will call. And yet he's very specific in the language that he uses. He uses covenantal language talking about how it's for you and your children, except the better part is that now it's going to include families from beyond the nation of Israel. Okay, so just something to think about. Another verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul... Uh, it's, sorry, I should say, in the, in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is speaking to the church community. He starts off very specifically to the saints in Ephesus. Uh, he addresses specific components of the community. He talks to husbands, he talks to wives. There are different aspects of the community that he addresses. But then in Ephesians 6, he specifically addresses children. And he says, obey your parents in the Lord. And it would seem that as Paul addresses the church community in Ephesus, that he sees the children as being part of this larger covenant community. Now, one more slide that I want to share, which I'm going to work through fairly briefly. Um, I guess the writing is kind of small, but these are the, the, the 10 examples that we have in Scripture of specific baptisms where people are named. Okay, so there are, there are 10 specific examples where we kind of have... Uh, baptisms in the New Testament. They're listed there. What I want you to notice is that five of them use the language, so-and-so is baptized, and their household. Now, on top of that, if we look at some of the other examples, uh, Paul didn't have a family to speak of. That's one of the examples that's given. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, I think it's fair to assume that he didn't have a family, um, and then Simon Magus, okay, another one, most commentators agree that he also didn't have a family. So when we start to look at the pattern emerging, it seems that there's, there's quite a few of the specific baptisms that use the language of so-and-so and their household. Now, I'm not making the case tonight, just to be clear, I'm not making the case that there were infants for sure in those households. I don't, I don't know. There may have been, there may not have been. But what I am saying is that Luke, as he writes the account of Acts is very specific about using covenantal language. 
He doesn't say the Philippian jailer and his wife, Susie, and their little boy, Johnny, or their servant, Sam, were baptized. He uses specifically covenantal language, so-and-so and their household, and every first century Jew would have understood that. So those are a couple of passages that I think suggest that children were still included as part of this new covenant community. Now, some people uh, take that to mean that when we're talking about children included in the new covenant community, that, that we're assuming that every child that's baptized is saved. I want to be clear, that's not what we're talking about. We believe that, that within the new covenant community, there, there are going to be genuine believers and there are going to be hypocrites. There, there are going to be children who are baptized who are part of the external community who, who do not respond to the internal reality. They, they don't respond with repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But our Baptist friends would, would look at the New Covenant community as being established only with those who are genuine believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll often hear the terminology of in Christ. Right? So they're only willing to baptize those who, who are able to make a credible profession of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I could just offer a couple of passages that I think would demonstrate that within the New Covenant community, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there continue to be both genuine believers and hypocrites. I'll offer two tonight just to keep things on track as far as time goes. Hebrews 10, 29, I think, is an important one. Uh, Hebrews, speaking to the Christian community, but he offers these words. He says, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? That's a word for means basically set apart and has outraged the spirit of grace. In this passage, the, the author is warning those who are part of this covenant community that, that it, is, it is a serious thing. It is a serious thing to tread underfoot the blood of the covenant by which you were set apart. Which suggests that this new covenant community can include those who both are genuine believers, and those who are what we would call covenant breakers, those who've rejected the covenant of God. One other passage would be John 15. Uh, John 15, 1 and 2, Jesus describes himself as the true vine. It's a passage that many of you are probably familiar with. And what's happening here is that Jesus is introducing himself as the author of a new covenant. In the, in the Old Testament, Israel was often referred to as the vine. So Psalm 80, for example, talks about how God has planted a vine, describing Israel. And Jesus here is saying, I am the true vine. But I want you to notice what, what we read there. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, notice how Jesus describes this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Jesus here is suggesting that within this vine, there are two different kinds of people. There are those who externally are connected to Christ as part of the covenant community, but, but they're, they're actually dead. They, they, they don't have a living faith, and the reason why is because they have not rested in Jesus Christ. They have not abided in Jesus Christ, which is the call for all of us. But Jesus clearly seems to suggest that there are two different categories of people within this community. Those who are genuine believers and those who we would say are hypocrites. And so when we look at this, I would argue that we see from Scripture continuity. We see consistency between the covenant communities in the Old Testament and the covenant communities in the New Testament, which by default would suggest that when we talk about things like baptism, that we should include the same people, both believers and their children. So I think this is just a, a, an introduction into the topic of baptism. I know I'm going to get some hard questions. Uh, I recognize that. 
But I, I do think that when it comes to even these difficult things, I would encourage us uh, to wrestle with the truths of Scripture. Also with those who have different positions to sit down, uh, to open God's Word, to pray through things. Uh, because we want to do what we do, not because it's tradition, not because it's routine, not because of what, it's, what our parents did. We, we want to practice what we practice as a church because we have a conviction uh, that this is what the Word of God calls us to do. So let me pray, and then I will enjoy some wonderful questions, I'm sure. I'll pray extra hard. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that um, when it comes to your word, uh, when it comes to your truth, that there are so many things uh, over which we as Christians all agree. Lord, and so even in a topic like tonight, where there are uh, differing viewpoints, help us to, to collectively really embrace the reality of Jesus Christ, uh, the salvation that's made possible through him. Help us recognize uh, both the promise and the warning, the call of, of Jesus Christ to abide in him. Lord, may that be true of us tonight. May, may we not be dead branches who are just going through the motions or perhaps who are uh, busy working extremely hard trying to produce fruit. Lord, help us to be those who, who are just resting in Christ for our salvation, knowing that we are loved and cherished by you through him. And help us also to, to wrestle with our view of, of things like baptism, but also our view of the church how do we see the body of Christ? Who's a part of it? What does that mean? What are the implications for our lives as individuals, as families, as parents? Lord, help us not to do what we do just out of routine, but help us to desire to long for faithfulness in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.